Welcome back, audience, to the second hour of our show. Remember, the first hour was in reference to marine plasma and the whole concept of liquid crystals. We're going from marine plasma to nanotechnology. And I have a very honorable and uh, special guest that is going to share with us his knowledge on the topic of building blocks of nanotechnology. Uh, this is Dr. Zong Lin Wang. He is uh, a professor at the Georgia Tech University. He's also a Hightower Chair in Material Science and Engineering, Regents Professor of Engineering, Distinguished Professor and Director of the Center of Nanostructure Characterization. He's from the School of Material Science and Engineering at Georgia Institute of Technology. And thank you very much, Dr. Wang, uh, for being on our show. And I know you just recently came back from Asia, so I appreciate your time and sharing it during this holiday season. Thank you. It is a great honor and pleasure to be in this show and to bring our audience about uh, what nanotechnology is about and what we do about nanotechnology. Yes, and uh, you were in a number of, uh, uh, per, you not only are the editor on peer-reviewed journals like the Nano Letters and other uh, journals that way, Dr. Wang, but I have given it to my patients and also anyone who has asked or contacted our company in reference to materials like uh, the nanotechnology, big things from the tiny world, and sharing that experience that is uh, sponsored by the nanotechnology excuse me, the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office in Arlington, uh, Virginia. And also, I want to thank you and your colleagues when you wrote a, a I, I love this paper. I use this paper every day of my <laughs> professional life in this field, which was from Advanced Materials in 2000, Silica Nanotubes and Nanofiber Arrays. When I was getting involved in uh, nanotechnology and uh, evaluating exposures in that uh, to uh, nanomaterials, uh, this opened a whole door to me in understanding and, and going into other uh, documents and books and understanding how it was being, um, I'm going to say manufactured, and we'll, we'll elaborate on that, but as a building block, so I could understand, because I came from a hardcore background of OSHA and exposures and monitoring in that area and industrial talks. So it's where I understood when I read, but it's like, because I'm not in a degree program in, in ceramics or anything, it was teaching myself as a good professor would, <laughs> you know, in the subject yes. matter to learn. So I appreciate it, and that paper... Um, I, I, I'm amazed at it uh, and how we've uh, matched uh, um, things, uh, you know, observations to it. So it's it's very nice, and I thank you very much for it. Uh, this paper was uh, published in 2000, so this was done work done almost 12 years ago. And when we talk about the building blocks, you know, in the in the, any material used today, atom. Atoms are the fundamental building block for making things. Anything is made of atoms. And back to some years ago, scientists start started the uh, small particles. When I was a graduate student back in 1983, uh, my PhD thesis was on small particles. Anything small, how small is that? Talk about a fine nanometer. Fine nanometer is uh, a. Um, it's about a thousandth of a hair width. Uh, it's around that level. So it's very tiny, small. And these things, when a collection of atoms put together, like a particle, and they behave like a big atom. So scientists and chemists can put this together from a so-called assembly. You know, like uh, uh, just like our living tissue, we have the cells, they aggregate together from a, a tissue. And in and, and, and the chemistry, they put this particle together, can form a, 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 a super atom made of materials. They're called building block, use these particles. That's the, one of the type of building block. The paper you are referring to was a, a silica a nanotube. And uh, this is so-called one-dimensional, like a, like a line shape, a wire shape of structures. 
scientists have developed uh, materials based on this uh, uh, use semiconductor materials, metallic materials, even oxide materials, and they can use it for biological sensors, interconnects for electronics, and also for uh, making energy harvesting tools based on these materials as a building block. So there's different group of materials we have been working on and the world have been working on for a range of applications from energy, electronics, biomedical to environmental to uh, to uh, personal electronics and even to national security. Right, and and your website at the university that you have is—I loved it from the first day I saw it too. It's like uh, books, you know, where where you can uh, check it out on the Wang Library of Nanoscience, and uh, it. Uh, audience, uh, do go to uh, Dr. Wang's uh, website, and you will learn a lot. It has beautiful reference materials there from cutting-edge journals and textbooks, etc. But it's like you said, Dr. Wang, you have to know how, what I'm saying is the building blocks, just like you explained, to create the larger molecules or the super molecules so that you can create the tool which I'm going to call the nano tool into the nano machine and how it starts. It's like if you start, do you start with a, when you're doing a micro array, which audience, that's where it makes a shape. It could be like a bullseye or um, connect the dots uh, in an um, example of. And how does that unfold? Does it, does it come out as a, a sphere first? Or do you put the spheres in the composite material, what they call nanocomposite, uh, like the glues audience? Or how does it unfold? Because now they have, as you said, the biosensors, uh, which are mesogens, pneumatic, which goes from the solid phase to the liquid phase. Uh, how does it get from making it to what, whatever, I'm going to say, the design or the architecture of a, a finished product in that area this is, uh, yeah this is a uh, might be a hard question but i don't mean it hard i i just yeah, because this has to go back to the basic chemistry let me give you one example what do we mean mm-hmm. by nano and why why they're so exciting why that's different from the rest of the other things we have been working for decades let me give you one example if you take a single gold atom the gold atom is a complete entity and it has certain number of electrons, some number of proton, and this atom does not want to lose any of its electron or proton. So it stays as one entity. Certainly, no physical property. You cannot measure the conductivity. You can measure the uh, thermal conductivity, whatever. But if you look at a big piece of gold, you know, like a wedding ring, okay, a piece of gold. Mm-hmm. It's behave like a metal. It has conductivity, thermal conductivity. It's a solid object. Bet- between this large shape of ring to a single atom, there's many steps. In one of the step, that means let's say if we have 50 atoms stick together from a little cluster, then they behave different from the bulk. Also behave from different single atom. In such a case. The gold atom has catalytic property. You know, gold is very inert. It does not uh, react with any other things. It's very inert. But when you make a 55 gold atom, this kind of cluster, the catalytic property is superior. So why is such? That's the property exciting the world, interesting nano. Question is, how do you make this gold cluster? This goes to the the extraordinary chemistry scientists have developed. When they make these gold particles, they can use solution-based processing, gas phase-based processing, soil gels, and vapor phase-based processing. They can make millions, billions of those particles simultaneously. So in such a case, what they can make is use uh, molecule that can isolate the particle one from the other so they will not aggregate from a big piece and preserve the entity of each individual particle 
and we can use that for practical application. For example, for some type of cancer imaging, for drug delivery, and for uh, catalysts. So chemistry can really control this to the level of very precise, very precise to the atomic level, and we'll be able to do that uh, uh, for a number of fields, for example, imaging, cancer imaging, and, and, and other applications. And, and Dr. Wang, when, like you mentioned, when you separate the atoms of gold and from so the, I'll give you an example, like you said, a, a 50 atom cluster of gold, and it got more catalytic properties. Uh, and audience, audience, that's the plus and negative charge of that uh, activity. Does it change color, or when it mixes with other uh, types? Because we see gold as what we know as the gold color, but if it was done as gold nanowires, would it still be gold, or, or may it be a different color, or is it due to it is possible dyes that are added to it? Yeah, it's a different color. This is a, for the color of the gold. The color of the gold changes as size. If you have a, a small particle made of gold, it appears red. The color appears red color, and when make a big pieces like a ring, it's golden color. So the that means the optical property changes dramatically as you change the size, as you change the size. And this is one of the example of the physical property change. The second thing that give you mechanical property. If you go home, you have a dish, right? You have a dish, and if you drop mm -hmm. the dish on the floor, it breaks. Because right. ceramic ceramic normally very brittle, uh, very brittle, but when you make a tiny little nanowires of ceramic, it becomes so robust. For example, we have worked on last decade for on a material of zinc oxide. This is a very popular material we use every day for. Uh, for multivitamin uh, in, the, in, the, in the ingredients, we use it for uh, drug delivery, for beauty cream. You know, for lady use for the for, for the beauty cream, and also mm -hmm. for uh, UV protection cream. That have this in 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 it in in the cream. Once you make this into tiny wires, how how small? Uh, let's say 50 nanometer. You say 50 nanometer. How big is 50 nanometer? Is a thousandth of a hair width. When you make that into that uh, small size and one-dimensional shape, you can bend these wires for 60, 70 degree uh, angle, and it still can come back as elastic. And when you make a big piece like a bulk of ceramics, it can suffer, it can suffer little deformation and, and easy to break. So the mechanical property improves dramatically as well. Right. And if you had like those nanowires you just described and it was mixed with, um, I'm going to say, your hair or, or, or other textures or other fibers, you could, could uh, possibly, uh, and you could share with the audience, Maintain that that new bond angle. Uh, yes, if the, if, com, if, the, if the materials are compatible, that's what I'm going to say. Uh, it, it can maintain that shape because this means once you use these nanomaterials, making some devices, and this device can subject to large mechanical deformation without uh, failure. So in, the, in a such case, you can maintain the shape and preserve the superior performance of the material as well. So that's make the nanoscale material have a, a superior uh, mechanical application. And we utilize this kind of uh, small nanowires for energy harvesting. For energy harvesting. Uh, I can elaborate more if you like on that. Yes, please, please. Okay, let me give you an example. <clears throat> uh, we make a lot of small devices. For example, one little small device that can detect uh, uh, biomolecules uh, in an environment. We can use that to detect the toxic gases, and we can fabricate uh, smaller uh, uh, transistors. And the key challenge is that each of these components need electricity to drive it. And uh, if you need electricity to drive the small devices, uh, the natural way is that you use a battery. Okay, let's use a battery supply. Right. 
the power. The question is that the device is so small, but the battery is rather large. Just like our, just using like in our car, we have to use a battery, but if we have to take that battery out, it's very heavy and uh, larger than a, a little battery that uh, like a double A that we would put in a flashlight. <laughs> yes. So therefore, can we first one? Can we eliminate the battery, or at least can we extend the lifetime of the battery? Make lot battery smaller. So we utilize this uh, tiny little nanowires to convert the mechanical energy into electricity. What what are the mechanical energy we talk about? Maybe people think about oh, gigantic ocean wave and uh, horrendous uh, hurricane. This kind of no. We talk about the your fingertip motion, just like you typing, and just like the uh, you talking, the voice you generated. That kind of magnitude of mechanical action. Because the, when a nanowire becomes so small, a very small force be able to introduce a mechanical deformation or shape change to, to the nanowires. So then you say, well, how does that uh, convert a mechanical into electricity? Zinc oxide has a property. It is called piezoelectric property. What's that? That means when this wire being mechanically changed shape, this little material the crystal generate a, a crystal potential. That means the ions in inside this crystal polarizes, give you a potential, and this potential will drive the electron to flow. So convert mechanical energy into electricity, and this effect is called piezoelectric effect. And once you use nanomaterial, you can make this effect much more significant, much more stronger. The force to drive it can be much smaller as well. So therefore, if you have an array of these wires make, you can generate a significant amount of electricity. And uh, for example, we started this work back to six years ago. And uh, today, we can generate electricity, which is enough to drive a, a liquid crystal display. We can drive a, a small uh, light emitting diode, and so can drive a self-power sensors so that no battery is needed. We can make a sensor. The sensor can drive itself by the electricity harvested from the environment. So it will work as an independent unit. Well, so, and and like when you mentioned the self-powered uh, sensors, would that be like in the environment, like outside, like by a tree or, you know, out in the like a park or anything environment? Or would you do you mean more in a a a human body, the environment, if they're using it in nanomedicine or anything, you know, to monitor the body? This can be used for all the purpose. Let me give you specific examples. For example, I appreciate that. Yeah, for example, um, the uh, we can we convert heart beating or the contraction of blood vessel into electricity. So therefore, if we have a glucose sensor, and we can this implant it inside the body and use the contraction of the of the blood vessel, we convert. That mechanical energy into electricity, and that electricity drive a glucose a glucose sensor, and then the signal send a signal to outside the body wirelessly. So this is one wow. by by application. Let me give you a second one: environmental monitoring. Let's say we have a big area, uh, lake or uh, forest. How do we know we have uh, no contamination? And uh, we have a variety of sensors. So we want to build a network. Let's say we can map the distribution of chemicals or gases around us, see any kind of toxic gases, carbon monoxide, uh, uh, the uh, hydrogen distributions. That's tremendous amount of sensors. But if you want to use battery power, it would be a huge task to, to, to replace the battery. Plus, you don't know what the sensor is. If you want to fish out, that's a lot of hard work to do that. So if you can make each sensor as self-powered, harvest the little wind energy in our environment, airflow, light wind airflow into electricity, we power the sensor and detect if there are any toxic gases, send a signal wirelessly, you can map the whole area without use battery. This is the and, and that's amazing because I could see the application of that and I, I'm going to put it in the category of calling it 
smart crystal moats or any of that type technology, how it could be used in a war place to make sure that our soldiers didn't have poisonous gases emitted on them, or even the fire of all that ammunition getting on you, or a fireman uh, maintaining a fire, you know, putting it out, as we have here in California, a lot of forest fires. And also, with my work in hazardous materials, I remember when ammonia spills would occur or the plumes would come out uh, where, um, you know, we had to block off certain areas and everything. So you could easily use this or incorporate this to get a grid around your containment site for hazardous materials or anything of that type of application, too. Yeah. Let me give you a third example. Let's say Mm -hmm. we have big Los Angeles areas, thousands of uh, homes, water supply, how do we know the water quality is well controlled? And can we map, can we have an in-situ, real-time de- detection of water quality? Is there any kind of uh, possible contamination we could have? So if you have this little uh, sensors inside the water pipe, use the pressure change or water flow inside the pipe, general electricity, you can detect uh, heavy metal contaminates. And then if there's any, you can send a signal out. And we recently made a mercury sensor this way. can detect heavy elements. Elements, If there's any around us, then can send a signal wirelessly. Because you can have millions of pipes around the city. And monitoring those ones is a tremendous task. So utilize this technology. We can improve our quality of life dramatically. And that's why there's a lot of industry uh, interest in today. They want to... To, to, to apply this for the sensor network technology. Uh, in fact, uh, if you have a sensor network, if you cannot make it self-powered, 90% of the sensor network will be impractical. You're correct, because there might not be electricity there. It might not have good connections. It's just like we had an accident last week on uh, one of our main um, highways out here, interstates, uh, where a um, tanker truck uh, of gas uh, exploded and then damaged the uh, bridge. And then they found out in the bridge it had cables of or sources of asbestos, et cetera, and thus delayed the repairs. Um, but there there had to be a lot of uh, changes in that system. So I can see the importance of this. And also, like where you mentioned, Dr. Wang, in reference to the memory sensor, excuse me, mercury yeah. sensor, yeah. and using wireless. From the wireless technology or the mercury sensor, what is like the lowest detection level that they would detect mercury? Because with different you know, regulations like EPA regulations or OSHA regulations, it may have a different monitoring level that they would say is, uh, is a safe or ill health effect from this exposure to mercury. Does, thank you for is that this technology question. available? Yes, thank you for uh, this great question because this is the, what the nanotechnology can bring to us. The sensitivity for detecting those kind of contaminants goes orders of magnitude higher than we used to detect. And this can detect a PPB level, part per billion level. Um, wow. Uh, yeah, and th- th- it's because the nanomaterial is so small, if any of this one eye goes on the surface, the connectivity will change dramatically. We'll be able to detect it. So that's the sensitivity goes at least a million times compared to what we used to do. So therefore, uh, we can choose the sensitive you want, what the sensor you want, and we can set up the sensor per the regulation of the, uh, uh, the, the, the government regulation. And then if the containment level goes to the specific, specified level, then you have a warning light, you have a warning signal sent out. Right. Right. And, and audience, I'm going to just share an insight in this. Um, in, in OSHA regulations, we always have what is the permissible exposure level and uh, the time uh, level. But in, in this, the threshold level, example, like if we were exposed to um, a workplace exposure to silver, the level may be 14, and the uh, threshold level is where you could get sick or it's a hazard because you don't have a respirator or anything. No industry or uh, government wants to get to a level where it's already past the level that you can get a disease from or initiate that symptom. So if it was a 14 level, 
of parts per billion, then it would be the action level or, or threshold level, which would be a, um, what do you call it, uh, seven. So it's like half the amount. Does not mean that that is a safe level if you're getting any symptoms or anything, but it's it's a guideline for what industry uses. So if you can do custom, I'm going to call it custom sensors, and make that in the commercial world, uh, Dr. Wang, you know, through the technologies and how uh, different industry is approaching it, that will help in a lot of areas because I know years ago when we used um, detector badges in industry, there was a, a very nice color reaction where it got certain amount of uh, parts per million for carbon monoxide, the little sensor would change uh, pink or then a different compound would change purple, uh, you know, a lavender color. So it was able for individuals that were using at that time a forklift that had uh, would create carbon monoxide and other diesel particulate, the, but monitoring the carbon monoxide within a large warehouse area, it, it helped in um, giving some guidance that way. So I can see how industry would be very receptive to these uh, custom sensors and uh, the use of it, especially since you don't need, like you said, it's just the, the gentle breezes of the wind that can keep that battery going. Yes, that's that's the uh, that's the key. And also, let's say, uh, for each of us, this our technology is also going to reach uh, our individual. The, the reason is because each of us, every day we have several electronic components. We have our cell phone, we have our probably IP4 player or something like that with us. And the future is that we're going to have more and more personal electronics and mobile electronics. And one of the problems sometimes is that uh, we uh, we don't have long enough battery to get those things running. But imagine every day each of us has to do some kind of exercise. We're walking. One person walking on average, the power is 67 watt. According to calculation. 11 watt can be converted to electricity. 11 watt. 11 watt, then if we can utilize the, the power we walk to generate electricity and put this nano generator inside the, your shoes, you're walking 30 minutes in your office or at home, it doesn't matter, and then we have a, we have a charge card. And charge it, you put in your cell phone and it works. So therefore, this not only may make sure your electronics working properly, but also is another energy saving and harvesting technology. So this can impact each individual of us in the near future. Right, and also even with the, I'm going to call it, uh, and I correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I honestly don't know what the correct technical term would be this, but um, I would call it enhancement, like just like you explained with the nanowires, uh, the zinc oxide or any of that to make electricity and make that storage battery. I've read in certain um, areas where you may have nerve neuropathy, meaning no feeling in the nerves or anything, they're doing uh, works with nanowires or nanomaterials and uh, looking at um, the clone cells of, I'm going to use the example like an elect uh, like an electric eel, uh, so that it can send other signal to help maintain the electrical current within the body. I don't know if you know about that, but uh, I see a, a lot of different sciences um, integrating into the nano world uh, for the needs of the public or uh, the business opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. Because this is a, the uh, scientists have used nanotechnology to uh, use the uh, uh, you know uh, electricity, electric signals to excite nerve, or, did, or study the, the nerve behavior. Use nanotechnology, uh, scientists make array of transistors, and, and when a nerve transduction uh, electric signal, scientists can de detect the, the the way the nerve transmit those signals. So those use nanotechnology, we can really probe the individual cell characteristic, individual uh, uh, nerve, the behavior, so that we can understand in depth how does our body work, how does our cell work, so we can uh, develop new technology, interface us 
with uh, future uh, future t technology. And uh, uh, let me extend that little bit of this energy harvesting a little bit. If we can make these things cheaper, because this material we use is green, we can make it cheaper. And if you put underneath the subway uh, uh, station, if you put underneath of the highway when a car runs over and the tire rotates, there's all kind of energy around us. That's purely basically waste energy in, 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 in many forms. We be able to have those energy for our uh, usage in, in, in the future. When you mentioned, I, I can understand under the subway, you know, meaning on the tracks, or not on the tracks, but meaning in that area, just like a train or anything. Yeah. But when you mentioned the highway, do you put it under the asphalt or on top of the asphalt to get it, or but by the side of the highway? Uh, underneath the surface, because when when you drive a car through a highway, then the car when the, when the, when, the, when the tire rotates, it's Pre produce a pressure on the road, so Correct. and this and then these uh, this pressure below the, the the surface of the road we can have this uh, layer by layer uh, nano generator stacked together. So when the when the road being compressed, then those nano generator convert to this mechanical compression to electricity, and then that's what I'm talking about. That you can uh, if you make it cheaper, that's that's a possibility. Right, and I know with uh, not only in the environment but in uh, medicine, meaning like in, I'm going to call it coatings on different types of, could be airplanes or cars or anything so that it has better protection from rust or uh, impact. Uh, they're using nanomaterials. But a, a lot of work, too, in where they would do in wound repair was using nano shells so that they could be used with either a, a glue, which may be a nano pardon me, a composite, or a laser that would actually sew up when these shells were part of protein that was induced to a body, would sew up a, a wound. Uh, very similar to the term nano stitches or any of this type thing, where um, in areas that you couldn't get into the area possibly, or in acts of war or anything, meaning soldiers that you could literally stitch up a body without uh, having a needle. Right. This is a this is a device use this kind of new technology for medical uh, purposes, and also the uh, there's a lot of things being developed. For example, uh, uh, interface human with 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 machines. Uh, this basically means interface us with. A computer, not through the keyboard, but through the uh, the uh, truly wired uh, structures. And uh, as you just say, that uh, the nervous system is the one of the way through electrical signal uh, transduction from the nerve uh, the, to the uh, electronics. The other things that uh, we are working on is utilize the uh, mechanical action because you know each of us every day is a lot of mechanical action. When I talk to you, when I move around, this all mechanical action. Those things mm -hmm. can pick a lot of electronic signals. And this, in the future, that how do we interface those mechanical action with silicon-based technology? Because silicon has extraordinary performance in electronics, in speed, in the frequency of operation, and manufacturability. But for us, that how do we integrate us with those kind of technology? It's become a challenge, so we we create a field that call uh, piezoelectronics, and this is utilize the piezoelectric potential generated inside as nanomaterials to control the signal flow into in, in a silicon-based technology. So in that case, we can use mechanical transduction to drive uh, and control uh, uh, conventional electronics, and that is a new thing. We are, are trying to study. So this along the line, scientists try to understand us with the machine, basically from the cellular level to tissue level and to real world. Right. And and with this piezoelectronics, when you're using the integration, meaning that, that category of uh, mechanics and electronics, uh, the nanomaterials, are they more of... I'm going to say transitional metals or ones that have certain qualities that can be incorporated in the design or I would just say the coupling with the silicon. 
that's the key part is uh, the uh, the materials we use is biocompatible environment friendly so when we use this and we can interface direct with biological system and then when you interface with uh, silicon based technology how do where's the bridge so this piezoelectronics is created to bridge serve as a bridge between us and a machine wow you you explain it so well. <laughs> I'm in, I'm I'm enjoying the class, Dr. Wang. Yeah, <laughs> thank and the you. The other technology that uh, scientists been develop is for the for the uh, from the uh, like for example like a, a cancer uh, a, a diagnostic technology, and uh, I'll give you one example. Uh, they use this uh, uh, gold nano rod. It's a it's a gold rod, but it's a rod shape, but but it's nano size because this. Uh, Asymmetric shape, you know, one side is larger than the other side. It is very sensitive to infrared uh, uh, image. Uh, that means they have a specific uh, infrared uh, absorption. So when you shine infrared uh, to the gold rod, its local temperature goes up. Oh. I mean, on the temperature at which the gold nano rod is placed goes up. So scientists find that, oh, if we can targeted deliver this to the size at which the cancer cell uh, locate. Then we shine it at a infrared light because infrared light have a deep tissue penetration. Then heat up the gold rod and the local temperature raise up, kill the local cancer uh, cells. And that's that's the technology uh, scientists being developed for future <laughs> cancer research. So this is just right one because that would be site specific. You know, if you match the the gold uh, nano rods with, uh, I'm going to say that even you could probably later on, uh, as it develops, uh, subspecialize it into different cancers and different locations where it would be, so that it's not hitting as we see with now with uh, many chemotherapy agents because they're injected or IV oriented uh, for the patient that the whole body gets exposed exactly. versus so a site-specific area. So this is called targeted drug delivery. Use nanotechnology. Once you deliver it, and use, we can use other technology to cure the disease locally. Now, with you mentioned nano uh, rods, and you said one side is larger than the other. Does that mean like I'm going to give you an example? Like in a drink or a cocktail, you have a stirring rod. Is that like a flat side, or is it just just one side bigger than the other side? You know, so the audience can picture that in the mind. Okay, it's like a is a rod is a, a rod shape. That means the diameter is five times smaller than the length. Okay. That's what it is. And then, a, and that would uniform. differ because, excuse me for talking over you. The the wires which you mentioned earlier, that like the gold nano wires, they're one one thousandth of a human hair, so they're smaller. So the rods are larger. Than the wires? No, uh, the no. wires means the aspect ratio. The length could be thousand times of the diameter. Gotcha. Okay, but for this rod, the the, the length is about five to ten times, no than ten, no more than ten times of the diameter. So it's shorter. Uh, what is a rod? Is a shorter wire. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> it's it can be literally uh, five one thousandths of a wire. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm learning. I'm learning. You're very, um, very, very talented. Thank you. Uh, uh, I always did good math. <laughs> uh, math is fundamental. The, the, yeah, that is. Once we man- master, as uh, Dr. Harris told us on one of our shows, once you master mathematics, science, uh, 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 what is it, physiology, and two other aspects, uh, of I'm going to call it the arts and sciences. Uh, you're you're ready for the um, the spiritual side. Uh, so it's quite interesting how it's all uh, intertwined in all of our lives. But yes. now, how would um, for our audience? Because a lot of us use, and I, I've read a lot of articles in reference to nano shells and nano shells, which uh, can be one nano component within another 
I want to say a, a nanosphere that uh, can be um, incorporated in or coupled with it. Uh, are they smaller than the diameter of a wire or a rod? The uh, the nano shells is uh, uh, first let's size. The size is about the diameter of the nano wires or in that range. But the structure is mm-hmm. that you can have a core, right? You have a core, you can have a shell. The core and a shell can be different materials, right? Right. That's what I was trying to material. say. The core different and materials. the shell can be – like I'll give you an example, audience. Like we have an egg, which we have in our refrigerator. We crack it open. The yolk and the white of the egg is different than the core, which is the shell. Or exactly. the shell. Yeah. Yeah, or sometimes the core. the core can be empty. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, and then that would shell. allow it to scavenger whatever it was designed to hunt or yeah, so to track. People, so scientists can, if you have this empty shell, they can put drugs inside the shell. And these shells can be delivered to the specific site and release the drug. Yes. And you know how you mentioned earlier on the show how gold changed its properties of even color I was uh, amazed at, because, you know, I wrote books on hazardous materials and that, and a lot of the composite materials are made out of, like, acrylonitrile, methyl methacrylate. Uh, Polymers, do they keep their same characteristics? I know they keep their characteristics as gluing together or or putting that uh, aspect, but uh, have you ever seen or in your work, Dr. Wang, um, how the toxicity changes or does it it's it, it does change the uh, uh let me uh, uh, get first get the the composite material composite material is one of the most important materials for today's society and the uh, scientists put this uh, different component together uh, like a metal with ceramic or for example uh, our dish today's dish is is a composite. is uh, is not as you fragile as used to be when you drop it, it broke. Uh, that was used to be, but today is a lot of tougher. That means it's made of composite material, ceramics with some other uh, polymer materials. And uh, for uh, poly- one of the typical t- polymer materials is uh, uh, polymer-based uh, composites for aircraft application. You know these uh, new mm-hmm. aircraft, sixty-seven percent are made of composite materials. They are lighter, they are stronger, and 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 also uh, have a superior mechan- mechanical property. So this is uh, uh, one of the major application in the next near future is nano composite for a range of uh, applications involving aerospace for uh, tools, uh, even for you know, like a baseball ba- uh, baseball uh, b- baseball pad. About this, also the uh, the, the golf ball. Uh, uh, this kind of uh, structure can be made of uh, uh, composite materials. It does. The toxicity does change because when the uh, when the particle becomes small, then the the capability of this smaller particle invented to biological system change behaviors. So there's a, a group of exciting study going on, fun they call nanotoxicity. They study mm-hmm. how does nanomaterial behave when the size becomes so small and how can we control it? So there's a a group of interesting study related to nanotoxicity and biocompatibility uh, going on around the world. Very good. I know it's made some uh, major advancements and uh, now uh, being evaluated um, in many different aspects uh, because the particles get so small and many of them are designed to go into the body and have a specific function as we you shared with us in treatment of cancer, but how do we know that it's out of it or, or completely used? But now with the technology you shared on those biosensors that could be added or incorporated with that technology. Example, like you had a cancerous tumor, you were treating it with the gold nanowires, and then you knew that uh, you used a certain quantity of it, meaning physician or or 
person who's administrating this, because I honestly don't know if it would go in radiology or where it would go. Uh, the, the thing is that then you could also monitor if you incorporated a sensor with it to make sure that it was all used up or all out of the body, couldn't you? Yes. So the scientists push the whole field forward, not only develop nanotechnology, they also study how does our body tolerate to the, to the nanomaterials. Uh, is uh, what what what? How does the nanomaterial behave inside our biology system? And uh, so they started the whole range of problems. Make sure it is safe and beneficial to us uh, if we use it. Right, which is it's going to be very good that way in, in identifying the safety of it and the benefit of it, and um, weighing those on the balance scale. The Advances, I mean, when you just look at even the aspect of Quantum Dots audience, which uh, allows you to see in different colors and the incorporation uh, within that fluorescent range, I mean, there's so many different things that you can use as, I'm going to call it, Dr. Wang, tags for the different technologies, even using Quantum Dots, as we learned from um, uh, you were the advisor from, from Dr. Uh, Daniel Moore, who was on my show. Uh, oh, yeah. In reference to nanoethics, wonderful uh, person. Uh, he told us that many, uh, because of these materials being so small, even the use of nano quantum dots uh, could be used as, I'm going to say, signatures or areas that you could put the trademark in uh, for the use of your products, meaning of the in these technologies. Yeah, the quantum dots is one of the most important material nanotechnology for bioimaging, for uh, study the uh, uh, unique optical performances, and for many other uh, fields. So this is one of the uh, key area people, scientists try to study. And uh, for us to go forward, that I think a number of things is that uh, we need to look for the whole field of nanotechnology. Number one is that we have a lot of uh, uh, technology invented. How do we do a good technology transfer so they can benefit to the entire society and humankind? And the second right. is that can we do nanomanufacture? Can we make these things safer, better, and at a larger quantity? The third one is low cost. Can we make it cheaper and better? Well, cheap is, is, is the key word. Fourth, environmental, health, and safety concerns. Can we resolve those issues when we use it? Lastly, we have to prepare our working force. For example, prepare our students, scientists to study the required courses and prepare the education program so they can be uh, adopt a range of jobs a range of uh, different uh, fields. One thing I feel nano is that it changed the culture of our research and and, and education. Uh, for example, used to be biologists, biologists, physicists, bi physicists, chemists, or phys chemists. They are a separate discipline. But when the nano things come to our education research program, the boundary between those disciplines become smeared out. Well, what is what is our future? Is multidisciplinary field. That means integration biology with engineering, integrate business with nanotechnology. So all this kind of change the culture of our research. That's where the exciting thing is going to come out. So therefore, we have to educate our students to prepare for those job challenge, for those for those kind of different uh, field because it's so broad and how within limited time how do we prepare themselves educate them for the future uh, working force so that's another thing uh, as us we also think and doing every day right and and that's so important what you brought out dr wang because i know myself uh being in the field and and being multi uh disciplined I can see the, the pitfalls of uh, people in uh, my age group or anyone that is, uh, you know, in the, say, 40 to 60 that's still practicing or in business or any aspect, if they don't keep up with the nano or have some kind of course or something that integrates in its applications, 
many, um, I'm going to say, traditional disciplines of biology or uh, medicine or any of these other areas just will not recognize um, one is exposures at the same time the multiple uses of it and uh, when example like when patients uh, talk to them uh, they won't even be able to explain it because they haven't really read anything or kept up with it in, in many of the the aspects of that right so that's why the we are designing some new courses to make sure we introduce the basic to the students and they can learn the basic and the fundamental and then based on which they can they can explore uh, further if they like, uh, if they are interested in and that will depend on what they're going to do uh, in, in the future. For example, uh, like uh, uh, one of the research I didn't cover it in detail, like uh, energy storage, battery. Mm-hmm. So uh, this is a huge area. So we need this. We need to develop solar energy. There's nanomaterials from the solar energy, nanomaterials for energy storage. These are going to be a huge application impact our society in years to come. So there, in that case, that uh, we are prepare our students to learn how does we if I convert the solar energy and electricity. Same time, how do we manufacture those nanomaterials, and how do we use those nanomaterials for energy storage? So those kind of things. We prepare them to meet the future needs for uh, for 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 for, for develop new technology. So therefore, I think the nano uh, bring a lot of challenge to technology, to ethics, to in, to to health, also to uh, challenge to our education program. But it is a very mm-hmm. exciting time because we are learning, doing different things every day. And that's where the exciting part of as a professor. Right, and you've pioneered a lot of this uh, application from the invention of uh, nanospheres, nanotubes, nanofibers, et cetera. But you, because of who you are and within the university system, you've seen the growth uh, from the creation of it into these other disciplines. And I appreciate that uh, very much and your dedicatedness in in it as a professional um, in that aspect of engineering, biomechanics, and and all of it, and ceramics. It's you've done you've done beautiful work, Dr. Wang, and so many we, of your students love your professorship <laughs> and your mentoringship. And Thank you. Uh, with, with I have a question because I came from industry in that, but with nano, even though we know it's small in that. Is a production facility needed as being large, like major uh, factories or anything? Because I know uh, many times you can make these materials as a required uh, part of a a curriculum within your, um, I'm going to say in your degree program or anything like that. So I I wouldn't think that you would need as much, I'm going to say, surface area as a warehouse or anything like that uh, in the production, or am I wrong? that does need a larger facility to manufacture because uh, 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 nano manufacturing is not only we make a smaller scale. For me, the world need we have quantity. And uh, I just recently visited a factory. They make uh, zinc oxide nanoparticles. They talk about uh, 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 five, 500, uh, 500 uh, to a thousand tons per year. This kind of wow. part. Uh, the, uh, the major application is for the uh, uh, co- cosmetic application, for beauty cream, this kind of application. So they need they need quantity, but at the same time, they they all this made smaller nanoparticles. So it is small, but we need a large facility to manufacture. Okay, so you need just like regular standard manufacturing facilities because of the need of the quantity or the demand from the consumer. Uh, exactly. which the industry will um, pump out, uh, I'm going to say, the materials, or, or I should say the product uh, for its use. And as you mentioned, you know, with cosmetics and that, I know uh, myself of being a female and using makeup, I, I've seen major changes in the areas of cosmetic and uh, using um, different materials like this, just as I'm seeing it now in the natural health products, too for enhancement or time delivery systems or bioavailability. Yes, that's right. That's correct. It's a, it's a field that uh, uh, needs a quantity so that uh, for catalysis, 
for example, for pollution, for water purification, this need a quantity, right? You need a large scale water purification for this uh, the catalyst for the energy conversion. That's also a large quantity too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and each one. Uh, uh, I love the aspect of each one having different properties, and because of. Ooh, I hear our uh, music. I want to uh, thank you, Dr. Wang, for being on our show and pioneering your work in nanotechnology. And audience, I want to say to you, please look at uh, the Facebook or any of the other areas that we do for our promotion of these shows because there's two prizes that you can win if you answer specific questions. And the one question with Dr. Wang's uh, hour uh, is what is the paper that Dr. Hilby always recognizes uh, references that he <laughs> authored? So you will win nanotechnology for dummies and several other nice gifts from our Bocce Me line. So thank you, Dr. Wang. Have a wonderful holiday season and uh, keep up the good work. And uh, I would love having you on the show next year whenever your availability is so that we can share with our audience the new discoveries that you're making. Thank you so much, and I wish you and your family have a great holiday season. And uh, let me just say one more correction. My university is Georgia Institute of Technology. Yes. <laughs> and we got to look at that because Dr. Hildy's great at getting it transposed. <laughs> Sorry for that, uh, Thank Dr. you very Ray. much. And, yeah, yes. really it's a pleasure. I'll come back later uh, to talk more about our new progress. I appreciate Happy that. New Year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Informed. Enlightened. Alive and amplified. This is the Living Light Network. I started at the uh, small particles. When I was a graduate student back in 1983, uh, my PhD thesis was on small particles. Anything small. How small is that talk about a fine nanometer? Fine nanometer is, uh, uh, f- um, is about a thousandth of a hair width. Uh, it's around that level. So it's very tiny, small. And these things, when a collection of atoms put together like a particle, and they behave like a big atom. So scientists and chemists can put this together from a so-called assembly. You know, like a, uh, just like our living tissue, we have the cells, they aggregate together from a, a tissue. And 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 in chemistry, they put this particle together can form a, 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 a super atom made of materials. They call building block uses particles. That's the one of the type of building block. The paper you are referring to was a, a silica a nanotube, and uh, this is so-called one. Di- Welcome back, audience, to the second hour of our show. Remember, the first hour was in reference to marine plasma and the whole concept of liquid crystals. We're going from marine plasma to nanotechnology, and I have a very honorable and uh, special guest that is going to share with us his knowledge on the topic of building blocks of nanotechnology. Uh, this is Dr. Zong Lin Wang. He is uh, a professor at the Georgia Tech University. He's also a high tower chair in material science and engineering, regents professor of engineering, distinguished professor and director of the Center of Nanostructure Characterization. He's from the School of Material Science and Engineering at Georgia Institute of Technology. And thank you very much, Dr. Wang, uh, for being on our show. And I know you just recently came back from Asia, so I appreciate your time and sharing it during this holiday season. Thank you. It is a great honor and pleasure to be in this show and to bring our audience about uh, what nanotechnology is about and what we do about nanotechnology. Yes, and uh, you were in a number of uh, uh, 
you not only are the editor on peer review journals like the Nano Letters and other uh, journals that way, Dr. Wang, but I have given it to my patients and also anyone who has asked or contacted our company in reference to materials like uh, the nanotechnology, big things from the tiny world, and sharing that experience that is uh, sponsored by the nanotechnology excuse me, the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office in Arlington, uh, Virginia. And also, I want to thank you and your colleagues when you wrote, I I love this paper, I use this paper every day of my (laughs) professional life in this field, which was from Advanced Materials in 2000, Silica Nanotubes and Nanofiber Arrays. When I was getting involved in uh, nanotechnology and uh, evaluating exposures in that uh, to uh, nanomaterials, uh, this opened a whole door to me. In- Imagine, like a, like a line shape, a wire shape of structures. Scientists have developed uh, materials based on this, uh, uh, use semiconductor materials, metallic materials, even oxide materials, and they can use it for biological sensors, interconnects for electronics, and also for uh, making energy harvesting tools based on these materials as a building block. So there's different group of materials we have been working on and the world have been working on for a range of applications from energy, electronics, biomedical to environmental to uh, to uh, personal electronics and even to national security. Right, and and your website at the university that you have is I loved it from the first day I saw it too. It's like uh, books, you know, where where you can uh, check it out on the Wang Library of Nano Science, and uh, it. Uh, audience, uh, do go to uh, Dr. Wang's uh, website, and you will learn a lot. It has beautiful reference material, understanding and in, in, in going into other uh, documents and books, and understanding how it was being, um, I'm going to say manufactured, and we'll, we'll elaborate on that, but as a building block, so I could understand, because I came from a hardcore background of OSHA and exposures and monitoring in that area and industrial talks. So it's where I understood when I read, but it's like, because I'm not in a degree program in, in ceramics or anything, it was teaching myself as a good professor would, <laughs> you know, in the subject yes. matter to learn. So I appreciate it, and that paper... Um, I, I, I'm amazed at it uh, and how we've uh, matched uh, um, things, uh, you know, observations to it. So it's it's very nice, and I thank you very much for it. Uh, this paper was uh, published in 2000, so this was done work done almost 12 years ago. And when we talk about the building blocks, you know, in the in the, any material used today, atom. Atoms are the fundamental building block for making things. Anything is made of atoms. And back to some years ago, scientists started